Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. As always, if you'd like to uh, subscribe and get updates when we've got new podcasts and content available, uh, go do that at reallifepharmacology.com and I'll email you a free PDF as well on the top 200 drugs. Uh, with that said, on the top 200 drugs, kind of um, unveiling a new uh, podcast kind of uh, platform or episode uh, here and really wanted to cover the top 200 drugs and my uh, game plan here is to really focus on uh, those things that frequently show up on board exams and so uh, that's what I'm going to do uh, today and going forward as well probably over the next uh, year or two here uh, with the top 200 drugs uh, my target is to cover five drugs per day or per episode, excuse me, and uh, when those are released, and then that's going to probably take me about 40 weeks, um, 40 episodes uh, to get those out to you. And again, really focused on things uh, that I've seen shown up in pharmacology exams throughout my career, a um, little bit of focus on clinical practice as well, some you know maybe cases and examples that I've seen. Um, but really trying to get you uh, prepared and, and ready for uh, your board exams and pharmacology classes throughout school. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get into the uh, five drugs of the top 200 that I'm going to cover today. Uh, first one is uh, escitalopram. Brand name of this medication is Lexapro. This is classified as an antidepressant. And, uh, you know, an easier way to kind of remember this one is the, the ending, um, you know, escitalopram and citalopram. You can kind of memorize two drugs there, knowing that they're in the SSRI class, so that can be helpful. Um, there are other SSRIs with different endings, so you can't totally rely on that, but um, that can kind of help you um, combine those two medications in, into one there. Uh, so uses, you know, depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, OCD, and essentially what this drug is going to do is increase serotonin activity in the brain. Uh, so basically increases serotonin uh, in the brain's uh, synapses, for example. Uh, adverse drug reactions, uh, serotonin syndrome has to be on your mind um, when SSRIs are being used. Very, very rare, um, but probably an easy one to remember if you can remember the mechanism of action that basically um, increases serotonin in the brain. Uh, a couple others that are definitely notable, uh, sexual impairment is definitely one I've seen patients report in clinical practice. Uh, hyponatremia is another one as well, so that's low sodium. So if I see a patient with lower sodium or we're having trouble getting it up or keeping it in the normal range, um, that's definitely a situation where you want to rule out an SSRI like escitalopram here. Uh, occasionally, there can be some you know, GI upset or diarrhea or constipation. Um, usually, it's not terribly problematic with uh, escitalopram there. All right, drug number two is Vicodin. So this is a combination medication of acetaminophen and hydrocodone. Uh, speaking on acetaminophen, we've got to worry about liver toxicity um, as we escalate doses and you know go above four grams, which hopefully we uh, don't do. Um, but I will say in in practice, it's definitely one medication to look out for uh, as far as patients picking up over the counter medications and maybe they're taking a bunch of you know Tylenol, acetaminophen already. And then we add on a prescription with Vicodin and that OTC use didn't get assessed appropriately. Um, we can end up in a situation where we've got some uh, kind of accidental uh, overdose where um, that patient education uh, and kind of that um, medication reconciliation piece slipped through the cracks there. So that's probably one of my, my biggest points, uh, takeaways there with the acetaminophen portion uh, of the medication Vicodin. Now, the hydrocodone portion, portion um, that is an opioid. Uh, so that is going to cause uh, constipation, uh, sedation. In the event of overdose, we're, we can cause um, death to the extreme case, uh, but that's going to be due to respiratory depression. So basically, um, it reduces the 
um, breathing capacity for a patient there. With opioids, there's certainly a risk of addiction and dependence, uh, so that is definitely problematic. Um, one boxed warning uh, drug interaction that's really, really important to remember is benzodiazepines as well as gabapentinoids. Uh, so benzodiazepines are like lorazepam and diazepam. Gabapentinoids, obviously that's probably gabapentin. Uh, pregabalin also falls within that class as well. So uh, drugs with that CNS depressant type activity uh, can increase the risk for opioid overdose and opioid overdose comp complications like respiratory depression. So obviously got to be uh, very, very careful with that. All right, next medication I want to talk about is lisinopril. Uh, brand name of this medication is Prinavil. It's got the ending P-R-I-L. That is definitely a good one to commit to memory. And you can recognize a lot of different ACE inhibitors uh, if you remember that ending. Adverse effect profile for this antihypertensive medication. Uh, elevations in potassium. Uh, so if you've got a hyperkalemia type situation, uh, an ACE inhibitor like lisinopril is going to be ruled out as a potential contributing factor. Uh, cough. Cough is the other major adverse effect. Uh, if you've got a patient that's reporting this issue uh, and you think it may be medication related and not an infection or something else going on, uh, you got to remember lisinopril can cause kind of a dry, hacking, chronic cough. Uh, last but not least, I do want to mention um, it, it can increase the risk of acute renal failure. Uh, it's probably more so in the setting of a uh, patient being on other medications that can increase that risk. Um, you know, NSAIDs are kind of a classic example there. Uh, diuretics can increase the risk for acute renal failure. So if a patient's on multiple of these with an ACE inhibitor, um, that increases that risk. Usually what we're looking for uh, is a bump in serum creatinine of 30% or more. Uh, so if you've got a patient that goes uh, with a creatinine from 1.0 and they go up to 1.5 after starting an ACE inhibitor or up to 2, uh, that might be a situation where uh, that lisinopril is uh, contributing to that acute renal failure risk. Uh, one other thing with ACE inhibitors, um, Hypertension can be an issue in pregnancy, and lisinopril absolutely should be avoided in pregnancy. Definitely a, a highly testable thing there um, to rule out on a question where you're asked which antihypertensive should be used uh, in this female, childbearing age, maybe they're pregnant. Um, ACE inhibitors absolutely should be avoided, like lisinopril here. There's tons of resources available at meded101.com slash store. I'd greatly appreciate it personally. Uh, if you'd go support the sponsor, that helps grow this podcast and help us reach more people. Uh, we've got NAPLEX, we've got BCPS, exam, study materials, ambulatory care, uh, BCMTMS, geriatrics. Uh, we've also got books and fun stuff too as well. Great gifts for, for people. We've got crossword puzzles. We've got... Um, case studies, we've got drug interactions, uh, all sorts of different books, resources, study materials uh, to help you prepare and pass for your um, you know, clinical exams, for your board exams, or for uh, clinical practice. So again, uh, go support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, number four, we've got Simvastatin. Brand name of this medication is Zocor. Uh, myopathy, muscle pain, soreness, uh, definitely one of the most important adverse effects with this uh, cholesterol medication. Uh, that can progress if it's severe enough to rhabdomyolysis, and that'll show up with an elevation in CPK. Obviously, as far as monitoring goes, um, we're just going to look out for those aches and pains increasing after starting or maybe increasing the dose. Or maybe if you know potentially run into a drug interaction that increases concentrations, um, which should be noted that simvastatin has quite a few drug interactions with CYP3A4 inhibitors. Uh, so definitely a good uh, drug interaction there to know uh, with this one. Uh, so again, that's uh, simvastatin kind of in, in a nutshell there used for cholesterol management. 
Uh, last medication I wanted to mention was uh, levothyroxine. So this is number five on our list today. Uh, brand name of this medication is Synthroid. And this is basically a medication used for uh, hypothyroidism. So it's a, a thyroid replacement type medication. The easiest way uh, to remember the adverse drug profile of levothyroxine is if you understand hyperthyroidism. If you understand that disease state, you'll understand what the adverse effects of levothyroxine are because essentially we're replacing um, thyroid hormone in the body or increasing the amount of thyroid hormone in the body. And we, if we do it too much, uh, that can certainly uh, present with symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Uh, easiest adverse effects, I think, uh, to recognize if you're presented a case or a question, um, think of levothyroxine as basically amping you up. So, you know, an increase in heart rate, uh, insomnia, tachycardia, uh, weight loss, anxiety. Uh, levothyroxine can kind of cause some of those symptoms if the dose is not correct and if the dose is, is too high there. So definitely an important thing to, to remember there. Uh, rare, rarely, um, if you've got a patient that's getting too much levothyroxine for too long, um, it actually can cause uh, osteoporosis or increase the risk for that. So that's kind of a, one that I've seen come up on exams before as well uh, with long-term uh, kind of excessive thyroid replacement there. Uh, from a drug interaction standpoint and administration standpoint, um, it's really, really important to be consistent with levothyroxine. So consistent administration, kind of same time of day, um, same way. And typically when patients are first given a prescription for levothyroxine, maybe they're diagnosed with hypothyroidism because their TSH is high, for example. Um, in that initial prescription, that initial education, uh, it's typically recommended to give it before breakfast and before uh, other medications right away in the morning. That's typically the way I would say most patients take it that way. Um, I have had patients take it with food. Um, not something I typically recommend if they're just starting it. Um, but if they've been consistent and their thyroid levels have been well within range, uh, it's probably not something I'm going to get too uh, wrapped up about. So Again, consistency is important in making sure we're monitoring that, that thyroid lab work to make sure we're not getting uh, too high or low. And of course, you can monitor that clinically as well. Are they showing symptoms of hypothyroidism? Well, then the you know concentrations they're getting probably aren't high enough. Same thing if they're showing um, symptoms of hyperthyroidism, too much thyroid hormone. Um, we can certainly you know adjust the dose or discuss um, the way it should be administered and, and figure out what's going on there. Uh, last thing with levothyroxine, there are plenty of binding interactions. You know, generally we're supposed to give it before other medications and food and all that sort of stuff. Um, notorious binding interactions um, are some of the supplements like calcium, iron, zinc. Um, those medications um, can bind up the drugs significantly and basically block absorption in the gut when we're taking this medication orally. So um, very, very important drug interaction with levothyroxine to remember there. All right, well, that's the top five drugs of the uh, 200 that I'm planning to cover over the uh, coming weeks and months on the uh, uh, Real Life Pharmacology podcast here. Uh, if you have any feedback, suggestions, things you want to hear, don't hear, that type of thing, uh, certainly open to that. It's challenging. I've got a broad audience of, you know, pharmacology students, pharmacy students, nursing students, med students. Um, so, you know, there's different depths depending upon uh, what we're, we're doing there. Um, but just really wanted to try to give you some uh, broad overviews of the top 200 drugs and some of the most important testable pearls that I've seen come up uh, on exams kind of throughout my career at different levels of learning pharmacology and, and medications. So, Hopefully this is, uh, series is going to be helpful for you. Uh, it's been based upon feedback I've, I've heard from listeners of the podcast uh, and that they really want to hone in on some of those uh, most important medications. Always remember, go to the website, reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, I've got a big list 
there of over 300 medications um, where if you want more depth on a specific medication, um, I've definitely covered them in depth individually. Uh, so go check out the list at reallifepharmacology.com. Pull up those old podcasts um, that you want. I've also got them categorized by disease state, you know, so cardiovascular and psychiatric and so on and so forth. Um, if you're studying a, a particularly, um, you know, a particular topic within uh, your classes or board exams or whatever. So uh, go check that out. Um, also, please support the sponsor at 101com slash store. We've got a growing list of resources there. We've got, you know, fun stuff, you know, crossword puzzles. We've got books on case studies. We've got books on drug interactions. Uh, we've got study materials for NAPLEX and ambulatory care and BCPS um, and all those different uh, board exams for pharmacists. So again, your purchases there go directly to support this podcast. So I greatly appreciate that. If you have any comments, suggestions, uh, definitely don't hesitate to reach out, meditation 101 uh, at gmail.com. Uh, you can also track me down on LinkedIn as well, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCPS, BCGP. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, take care and I hope you have a great rest of your day.